All right. Hello, everybody. Let's get started. So I hope that all of you can hear me well. First off, thanks for joining, um, taking the time to listen uh, to this Brightwells webinar on the future of mobility. Maybe to give you a bit of an introduction and also a bit of context. My name is Domin Achte. Uh, I am a consultant at Brightwells. We're a young boutique management consulting firm. Uh, we focus on all things business transformation related, ranging from uh, the strategic space to operations, as well as data and digital. In more recent years, we started gearing our focus a bit towards the sustainability transformation, um, something that we believe will have a very profound impact across our entire economy. And it was, let's say, that which we took as a starting point to review and scrutinize our own mobility strategy. Talk a little more about that later, but it's just to give you a bit the, uh, the context. Now to give you the, the structure of today's webinar, um, I'll start by going over what we see happening on a, on a micro level. I'm guessing that most of what I will be saying will not sound as particularly new or exciting, but I do find it useful to make, to make that explicit, those trends and developments, because it'll set the stage a bit for the second part of the presentation, um, which is an honest and open testimony of how we at Brightwells have started acting on those developments, on those challenges. Um, and hopefully it can serve as some, some food for thought and some inspiration for you as an employer or an employee. Um, to acknowledge the fact that things are changing and that the ground is shifting a bit below our feet when it comes to mobility and that it might be useful to start doing a similar exercise at your company. I'll be talking for about 25 to 30 minutes, so I'll leave some time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. I believe that there's a Q&A uh, section or functionality in this Zoom meeting, so feel free to, to, to type your questions and we'll be sure to, to get back to those at the end of the session. All right. All right, so let's get into it. So first of all, how is traditional mobility being upset? Um, here there's really four key trends that I'd like to discuss and go over. And the first one is a very obvious one. It's, it's regulation. Um, most of you will be aware that, uh, of the fact that on a European level, you have the Green Deal, uh, which is basically just a broad set of policy initiatives um, with the overarching aim of making Europe climate neutral by, by 2050. Now, when you look at the European Union's emissions today, um, a bit more than, than a quarter of the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from the transport sector. Um, and it's arguably one of the harder sectors to decarbonize. Um, when you merely look at, at passenger cars, vans, trucks, and buses, it's about one-fifth. Um, so the idea is that within less than 30 years from now, those emissions drop to zero, as well as all other ones, obviously, as well. But uh, that's a bit the scope of uh, the discussion today. When we zoom in on Belgium, that number is actually even a bit higher. Uh, it's at 26%. And that will likely not come as a big surprise, uh, given our love for company cars in this country. The majority of the vehicles on, on our Belgian roads are actually company cars. It's at 57%. Now, again, on a European level, the ambition is uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, but actually, on, on the member state level, on, on the local level, our own national level, our government has decided uh, that all new company cars will have to be emission-free in five years from now. So that's just one uh, rule or one law that's being uh, implemented, but it's part of, let's say, a bigger package of, of, of fiscal reform. I'm not going to go into too much detail on, 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 on all of those rules, but it's a bit similar to, to, to gun possession law in the US, uh, where, where Belgian policymakers have tip, typically shied away a bit from uh, any sort of extensive reform when it comes to tax regulation on company cars. I think about 10 years ago, um, there has been a sort of a trend break. Uh, first, you had this minor change where 
uh, the benefit and kind calculation became proportionate to a company car CO2 emissions. And then later, um, you had the introduction of the mobility budget, uh, which is a, a great way to encourage employees to, to opt for alternative and, and environmentally friendly mobility solutions. Now you have this very comprehensive fiscal stimulus package that has been decided that will really incentivize uh, the adoption of, of electric vehicles through, for instance, tax breaks on the installation of uh, charging facilities at your home. Another development that I think is quite important as well, and is not specifically focused on, on company cars, but is, for instance, the low emission zones that we have in various big cities across, uh, across our country. And it's just to show that regulation uh, is becoming more and more stringent when it comes to uh, combustion engine cars. The last statistic that I want to show you is that last year, only 3% of newly sold cars were emission free. And given all of these regulatory developments that I just mentioned, you can certainly expect that number to skyrocket over the next few years. Um, so again, this is regulation. So that's more of an, an, an external push towards a new form of mobility. However, something else that we see, um, which is more of a, an intrinsic push or development that's taking place, um, is the sustainability wave. And I already talked a bit about that earlier. Now, sustainability, I always feel that it's a, a notion that, that requires a bit of nuance, uh, because often the first thing that comes to mind when thinking of sustainability is the environmental angle, uh, which is certainly an, an integral part of, of this whole idea. However, there's also an engagement angle to it, uh, which refers to sustaining the ability to, to retain and, and, and engage employees, customers, uh, connecting with your stakeholders in a favorable, favorable way as part of that effort. And then lastly, there's the economic angle, uh, which refers to the ability of sustaining the financial health of your business. And here the nuance is, yes, it's a capitalistic angle, um, but it's something that our CEO refers to as, as conscious capitalism. Uh, you will obviously want your, your business to succeed, but not at the expense of the environment and all the people that you engage with as an organization. So it's really all these three things all at once. The sustainability wave is a big one. And, and again, it's something that we believe in quite heavily. It's not just something that, that's taking place in politics anymore. It's, it's starting to hit us softly in, in, in various parts of the society, but it will certainly crash in hearts um, all over, uh, probably quite soon. If you're not convinced, uh, let me just give you a quick example to demonstrate uh, that statement. Take the example of the food industry um, and veganism. Like 10 years ago, people who, who ate vegan yeah, were considered as people who were on a, on a hyper-restrictive and even unhealthy diet. And you fast forward 10 years to today and, and that thinking has become completely outdated. Uh, eating vegan has, become, has, has gone from something being very niche to really breaking down the doors of, of, of mainstream perception. And this is coming from somebody who is not vegan at all, by the way, I, I appreciate meat, but it's a development that I, that I see and, and that I acknowledge. So this wave, again, it, it's, it's starting to hit us. And what we also see is that it's, it's hitting us at various speeds across different sectors. And recently we did a Bright World Sustainability Survey where we yeah, tried to gain a bit more insight on, on, on sustainability in general and to which extent it is something that is uh, yeah, picking up pace in our own country. And what we saw or what we have learned is that, for instance, in, in the energy and utility sector, not surprisingly, you have these investments and then this, this awareness already uh, heavily present, whereas in other sectors such as law enforcement and security, that's far less the case. So what we believe is that sustainable, sustainability will become the absolute norm, uh, regardless of the different sectors that, that we have in our economy. And going back to the topic of mobility, it means that you will have to come up with a sort of strategy that's not only environmentally friendly or 
It also has to be economically sensible. And it has to be appealing to your employees all at the same time. A third key trend is the COVID aftermath. And here it's a bit harder to predict how exactly that will pan out. Um, in any case, as you all know, uh, the pandemic has had a very sudden and, and profound impact on mobility in the short term. And you can expect that certainly at least some of those effects will be longer lasting. And what the new baseline level is, that's a bit harder to predict. However, it's clear that, that homeworking, for instance, uh, will be, become more socially accepted, which will put a sort of downward pressure on mobility demands in general. Um, but something that I think you cannot overlook either is this newly found appreciation for personal health, where people prefer to take the bike or walk um, for short distance travel. So in summary, there will surely be a shift in, in mobility demand um, due to, let's say, the pandemic, uh, both in terms of quantity, but also in, in terms of quality or the composition of that mobility. A last key trend is innovation in the mobility space. And here we see lots of things moving as well. And it's, it's really hard to be exhaustive here. So I'm just going to give a few examples. But the first one is shared mobility. And for those of you living in the city, I'm sure that you will have seen the scooters and, and, and the cars of companies such as Poppy and, and Lime. And it's really nothing short of amazing of how quickly these innovations have been able to establish a foothold in the market. And what you also see is that there is plenty of, of new and exciting things on the way as well. Uh, recently, I read an article about a Hyperloop train um, potentially being installed between Brussels and Antwerp, which would cut down the commute to a mere six minutes. Um, there's also various cities in Asia that are experimenting with, with drone taxis. Um, so what we expect is that technological innovations will really upset the market in the coming years, and there will be far more tools in the toolbox to choose from. I can imagine that when you think of a Hyperloop, you think of these futuristic movies in the 70s, and it seems a bit out there. But let me just give you a quick analogy. Um, I'm 29 years of age, and when I was a 10-year-old boy, nobody had a mobile phone. Nobody had a cell phone. It was just too expensive, and everybody just used the landline to communicate. Five years later, I'm a 15-year-old uh, pupil at school, suddenly everybody had a mobile phone. You go in, um, another five years in the, in the future, I'm 20 years old, I'm a student in Leuven, everybody has a smartphone. Um, so in a time span of less than 10 years, you have this single technological innovation that has been able to radically change the world. And it's just to show how quickly these innovations can find market penetration once, once the scale is there and once the, the economics start making sense. Some of these will fail, but some of these will not. Right? So it's uh, important to consider that. So just to summarize, uh, what is upsetting the mobility space or mobility market? You have these four things coming together uh, that ha are happening or, or, or will happen in the, in the very short term. And they make for a very colorful cocktail. Everybody will have to drink it. And the question is, how can you avoid being hungover? So now <clears throat> I'd like to move to um, the second part of our presentation, where we'll go a bit more into detail on, on how we as Brightools have acknowledged this and are trying to respond to these different challenges. As I said before, our initial take or starting point when reviewing our mobility strategy was sustainability. Um, and more specifically, the environmental angle of sustainability. How could we become CO2 neutral? And obviously our mobility, our cars are a big part of that. So we did a CO2 analysis and a very popular method to do CO2 analyses is disaggregating uh, the problem into different branches, smaller branches uh, called scope one, two, and three emissions. I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with this uh, this approach. What we, what we immediately found, at least for our company, is that our scope one emissions, um, which for the vast majority represents our cars, 
um, was the main CO2 driver. And it represented approximately three quarters of our total footprint. However, at that point, we realized, okay, now we're looking at the environmental angle, but there's a bit more to this whole idea. And, and we wanted to use that opportunity to ensure that as part of the transition that we need to go through anyway, um, we also try to boost the engagement and economic value in parallel. Um, so from that perspective, we started looking at electric vehicles, uh, which at the time made the most sense. What we eventually realized is that for electric vehicles, um, there's certainly environmental value there. Yeah? Um, I think very few people will, will argue with that. And actually the economics makes sense as well. Electric vehicles are a bit more expensive to buy or lease, but their run cost is far lower. When you, when you consider the run cost on a per kilometer basis, an electric vehicle is about half as expensive as, a, as an internal combustion engine car. Where we saw the challenge was a bit the inconvenience of driving electric. And there are three things there. First of all, there's the range. Uh, an electric vehicle doesn't, isn't able to drive that far today as an internal combustion engine car. There's also the inconvenience of having to charge, <clears throat> which takes quite a bit more time. Uh, today, your petrol car runs out of fuel. You go to the petrol station, you fuel up, and the process takes five minutes. And then lastly, Charging stations and charging facilities are less abundantly present than, than traditional petrol stations. So in summary, when, when you look at this from a sustainability perspective, you have two of the three boxes there ticked. Uh, so at first sight, there was a bit of an inconvenience with driving in uh, an electric vehicle that, that yeah, seemed to be a bit of a step back compared to the SS. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board and felt like, okay, let's approach this whole exercise a bit differently. So we made it a collaborative exercise and we leveraged our collective intelligence. And our approach was to be really open, honest, transparent, and explain, listen up guys, we have these dirty polluting cars. Uh, we need to do something about our CO2 emissions. Um, but at the same time, we would like the way forward in terms of our mobility solution to be cost efficient as well, but also appealing to you as an employee. So what kind of solutions would you put forward given this dilemma? And the strength of this model was really that immediately you're involving all of your people rather than it just being a, a one-sided unilateral exercise. You're also already triggering people in your organization to get in a particular mindset and you're gearing them up for change. And then lastly, you're getting a bit of a feel to which extent there is support or resistance uh, to the change. And for us, there certainly was some resistance there yeah, um, when it came to driving electric. People who weren't driving electric seem to be a bit less prone or uh, seem to be a bit hesitant to make that change. But what we also learned is that people who were already driving electric actually considered it to be a, a step up compared to what they were used to. The, the driving experience was better, uh, it's more comfortable. And really what we learned is that, okay, it's more, more than likely a sort of paradigm shift that we have to go through. And we are used to, as I said, you run out of fuel, you go to a petrol station, you top up and it's done. Whereas driving an electric vehicle, at least today, requires a bit more of a meticulous planning. Uh, you're starting to run out of battery, uh, your range is running low. Um, it, it, it's not a one-off thing. Uh, so what they indicated is, okay, you go to the shop, you go to the Lillez, you use the public charging facility that's available there. And for the 20 minutes that you were in the shop, you were able to chop, top up your car for a bit. And it's more of a, yeah, it's, it's a different way of, of getting around really. So again, a paradigm shift uh, that we would likely have to overcome with some sort of awareness raising campaign um, in combination with uh, yeah, getting your people very informed on, on, on how to drive electric, right? What we also found out is that there is no one size fits all solution, at least not for us. 
Uh, we learned that people at Bright Tools, when, when they start their careers with us, what they prefer is that they have the comfort and that their mobility is arranged for them. So in early years, when people join Bright Tools, it's best that they get, let's say, a sort of solution in their, uh, in their labs. And then people who are, let's say, in their, have a bit more working experience at Bright Tools, they indicated, I'm actually more open to self-managing my mobility by using a mobility budget. So we came to this approach or this solution, um, which is a bit two-sided. Uh, so again, you join Bright Tools and everything is laid out for you. And then as time progresses and you move on uh, in seniority at Bright Tools, at some point you get a mobility budget. People can decide for themselves how they want to get around. Maybe not even opt for a company car at all, um, which is perfectly possible with, with the mobility budget. It's also possible with the mobility budget is that you can opt for alternative modes of transport where you're effectively responding to innovations. Um, the ones that I talked earlier uh, about uh, shared mobility and whatnot. The expenditure on, on those alternative forms of mobility um, are also eligible to be used in a mobility budget in the second pillar. So we approach this whole thing a bit like a political party does before an election. We wanted to find out, okay, what, what, what do the people want? Fully realizing that everybody has different preferences and everybody is, is located differently on the spectrum. And we wanted to come up with a strat strategy or a plan that is located somewhere on that same spectrum where you would satisfy the needs or the desires of most of your employees. Um, and are you able to satisfy everybody? Of course not. Um, also important to point out is that this step one and two, conducting surveys, making it collaborative and coming up with a solution, most people think that it's a, a linear exercise. But of course, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's iterative. Right? It's, a, it's a sort of agile approach that you need to take where you build and test. And you repeat that process over and over until eventually you get to something that you are satisfied with as an organization. Um, again, fully realizing that it's, that it's an impossible feat to, to make everybody 100% satisfied. And this feedback loop is something that comes back in, in our next step as well, which is our transition roadmap. Here, there's four main things that we wanted to include in the actual yeah, execution of our plan. Uh, first of all, there's the transition. And we decided to gradually phase out our old policy in favor of the new one. And along the way, uh, see, okay, where are the priorities, the big wins um, in terms of CO2, but also economic value as well as engagement value. And then secondly, this feedback loop. Uh, so make it a continuous thing. We were continuously learning of, okay, we're doing something differently. What kind of feedback can we collect from the people who are already uh, transitioned to that new policy? How can we improve it for the people who are yet to transition? Third element is tools and technology. So a big one to point out here is that for the mobility budget, if everybody has, let's say, a big bag of money that they can spend at their own discretion every year, um, there's quite a bit of admin behind that. And there, there's a great tool uh, umbrella out there that, that will help you do that, uh, which, which simplifies and, and really automates that whole flow for you. Uh, other tools that we use is, is yeah, CO2 measurements and, and so on. Um, but it's important to, to realize that there's uh, lots of software and technology out there that you can use uh, to include in this whole mobility plan. And then lastly, obviously, there needs to be a legal document uh, that your people will sign uh, that needs to be compliant with, with local law. Uh, and that needs to be written up as well. So going back to our initial aim of becoming CO2 neutral and specifically getting to a zero emission fleet, um, our estimate today is that we, that we will have a zero emission fleet in about three and a half years time. So it's always good that to, let's say, plot your whole roadmap on a sort of time axis or a Gantt chart um, to see, okay, what's the plan here? Where are the big milestones? And where are we going to end up? When and how are we going to do it? 
So again, this plan, we're currently turning it into action. And as you can see from the smiling faces on this picture, uh, the feedback so far has actually been quite positive. Um, I do need to say, uh, I don't want to sell propaganda here and we're keeping a close eye on this. Um, we're measuring the success of this whole journey based on the three sustainability dimensions that I mentioned earlier. So we're quantifying and measuring um, the impact of this new policy um, in numerous ways. So for the environmental value, it's CO2. We measure our CO2, we plot it on a, on a graph, and we see, okay, uh, is it improving? Is it in line with our expectations? For the engagement value, it's CSS. Um, so employee satisfaction. Um, specifically with regards to the mobility offering that we as an employer offer to Brightwell's consultants. So again, here it's, it's a feedback loop. You get uh, input from, from the people who have transitioned. It might be an argument to adjust your strategy, your plan, your tactics along the way. And then lastly, of course, the economic value, huh? which are numbers or financials. We try to see, okay, as I said earlier, there's a, a bit of a larger initial cost when driving EV, but our business case showed that, okay, there's, there's quite a bit of savings to be attained from, from driving electric um, over the next, in this case, five years. Are we actually realizing those savings? Huh? So that's also an important uh, sort of business case backtracking that you can, uh, that you can add. So in summary, these are the steps that we are taking uh, today. Um, so again, we started off with making it a collaborative exercise rather than a unilateral one, involve our employees, try to come up with a, a solution that sort of fits into those desires. Um, and we iterated steps one and two numerous times. Then we drew up a roadmap where we said, okay, there's four key elements where we need to consider. The implementation, which is really where we are now. So it's a sort of business transformation where okay, people are yeah, organized or, or, or um, getting around in a different way. It's, it, it requires a bit more planning for those that are driving EV. Um, how can we guide people in the right way in order to make that a success story? And then eventually what we have started doing now as well is backtracking this whole thing. Uh, so what was important for us is that for the, at least for, let's say, the more uh, sustainability angle, you have these three dimensions. Um, we want to make sure that the impact that we initially foresaw on each of those dimensions was actually attained uh, at the end of the ride. So voila, this is, um, let's say, a short um, story or a short summary of, of, of the journey that uh, we have been going through and the whole idea of this webinar is that hopefully it can inspire you as an employer or employee or fleet manager or whatever um, to start doing this as well because we believe that likely virtually all organizations in Belgium that, that offer company cars today uh, will have to think about this at some point um, and we believe, given these four developments and, and, and trends that are taking place, that um, there is certainly a time to act and, and there's no better time to act than now. So voila, that's the end of my speech. Um, I hope it was somewhat interesting for you and I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, I see two questions now and um, first of all question domain i don't think you see it huh? um but the first question is can you give an indication of the percentage of savings across your lease periods that's a good question um the percentage that i don't know by heart to be honest um what i can share is that what we did in our business cases we we considered the average amount of kilometers that an employee drives on a yearly basis. Um, took into account the growth that we expect to have in, in, in the coming years and the amount of kilometers that we will drive uh, as an organization for yeah, coming years, uh, taking into account those two parameters. And there's two scenarios. Uh, either you would drive combustion engine cars and then 
the cost is X. And then when you drive uh, an electrical vehicle, you know, when you're driving full electric, it's about 50% of that amount. So in terms of yeah, fuel costs, we have a saving of about 50%. At least that's the estimate today. I know that energy prices are volatile today uh, and that might impact our business case. But there was a 50% saving there. Um, I do have to note that there's a, let's say, a negative cash flow impact in terms of the initial cost. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the cost of acquiring or leasing an electric vehicle today is, is higher. Uh, I do expect that the scale goes up. Um, electric vehicles will, will become as expensive or maybe even cheaper than, than diesel or petrol cars. But I don't know the, the percentage on, on, on the full um, business case by heart. So, no, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, the second question that was also posed, um, also anonymous, is how would you implement this in a larger organization? Yeah, good question. Um, so just to be clear, we are a 30-man company more or less today. And I understand that it's a completely different dynamic. Uh, it's also white colors uh, only that we, that we employ. And I can understand if your organization is large, then this exercise becomes a bit more complex. But what I do believe is that, especially in these steps one and two, uh, oh, I'm too far, I'm way too far. I do believe that, that this same approach holds as well, um, because by making it a collaborative exercise, uh, again, that's what I, what I spoke about earlier, there's, there's an extremely high value in, in taking that approach where you try to involve employees and, and, and try to get their minds on, on, okay, there's an issue here, we need to do something about it. And I think most people today will agree, at least for the emissions part, it needs to be addressed, right? There's, I mean, there's the regulatory aspect, but there's also the intrinsic motivation to do things differently. So to answer your question, I think it's a scalable approach um, to a certain extent. I think the surveys, the interviews, and the whole collaborative thing is something that you can repeat in a larger organization as well. Where it becomes a bit more difficult likely is in step two, um, because again, we are a 30 man company. I don't know the exact numbers by heart, but let's say that we would be able to satisfy 25 people of the 30. That's, that's a fairly good uh, ratio, right? For a larger organization, yeah, your, the preferences of your different employees will be more uh, dispersed uh, and it will be a bit more complex. So I guess that this step will be a bit more time consuming and, and harder to tackle, but I don't think it's impossible. And then for the roadmap uh, and the implementation, it's, it's really the same thing. Huh? It's uh, looking at your employee base, the cars that you have today, or the mobility solution in general that you have today. Uh, how are you phasing it out in favor of the new one? Um, I do have to admit that uh, this is an approach that we have applied in our own organization. We have not done this at one of our clients or anything like that. So I'm not speaking from experience here. But my feeling at this point is that it's uh, something that you can do in any sort of uh, size of organization. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions that are not posed yet. Don't see things coming in. Um, so maybe your last, I can give you the word back to me for, your, yeah. for your last words. Yeah, maybe last words. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. I would appreciate any form of feedback. So don't hesitate uh, to drop me a line on LinkedIn or send me an email. Um, if you were to have any other questions uh, that would pop up throughout the course of the day or the week, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. And be sure to check out our website. Uh, I think we have some uh, some content on this as well. So voila, thank you. And uh, yeah, hope to speak or see you soon. And I wish you a great rest of the day.